All right, good morning. I'm Alex, still. And uh, I'm opening the last column, the third column on the right of this uh, first booster box of sorcery contested run. Just woke up after a good night's sleep and yeah, it still has that like kind of Christmassy feel of opening packs. It's been a long time, you know, like you know, eight years since I uh, just jammed through a box of cards. Uh, so just skipping through cards I've seen before. And uh, the elite from this pack is Nature Explosion. Um, you know, I think that this card uh, dealing seven damage destroys almost every single creature that exists. And um, the explosion pattern dealing five to adjacent spaces uh, deals with most creatures people play. And um, you know, e even the threes are pretty substantial. So um, I think that seven is very expensive. You know, I feel like you get your first three sites for free, and then uh, you know each uh, mana progression after that you know, it takes two turns, so casting something that costs seven is generally not going to happen until um, it's going to take uh, eight, eight turns to get the last four mana and three turns, so like turn, turn 11. Um, not a lot of games go that long. Um, obviously, if you're playing Pathfinder, uh, you can get to that on turn seven. Um, which is one of the reasons that Pathfinder is so impressive. If you're playing Earth, uh, there are you know, quite a few cards that can uh, increase the rate that you're getting to seven. And um, yeah, there's obviously the Alchemy Nine cards to uh, cheat your mana rate at the cost of you know, some cards from your deck, which I think is a totally fine deal. Um, if I'm going to be spending a, a mix to cast something that costs seven, I probably want a creature that's going to you know, persistently affect the board uh, and not just a, a one-off effect like this uh, explosion. So um, I think that this its best home is in ramp decks where you're looking for powerful effects. Um, I think that you know it's less good than Crater Eyes, but um, like you know, in terms of high impact cards, like I think it's a totally all right one. Um, I saw people using it at the tournament at Gen Con, so um, yeah, I think it's it's definitely like a card that I will play in ramp decks. Uh, let's see if there's anything else new in this pack. Uh, looks mostly like familiar stuff, so I'll leave on this tufted turtles. Next pack. Um, oh, yeah, great. So we got a lighthouse, which I'm not sure which duels I've opened so far, but I think this is a, a lovely one. Both nice art and uh, air and water go together well as a kind of controlling combo. So Pudge Butcher, uh, four mana, two earth threshold, five power. Uh, it's immobile, uh, but you can tap to shoot a projectile, and if it hits a unit, it can drag it to this location, and then Pudge may fight it. Um, so, you know, this this is a good example of a, it's a creature, but ultimately it's more of a control effect unless you can figure out a way to move it. Uh, five power for four mana is a, a great rate, and five power compared to most other creature sizes um, is pretty nice. So I think that this is um, playable, and I think it's particularly good in uh, an air deck, because if you can uh, blink it or harpoon shot it or you know some other effect that moves it, uh, you can also get it onto your opponent's spaces and, you know, you can attack uh, their life total. Um, so I think this is, like, uh, a good card. Um, 
I think that there's probably enough other powerful creatures that don't have dependencies that um, I'm not sure it's great, uh, especially in Earth. They have a lot of big creatures. Um, but I am interested particularly in the ability to like pull things out of groups of creatures. Um, you know, I think that often people get to block and it can be hard to kill the thing that you're trying to kill. Um, so I think it has, I think there's a lot of utility. Um, and it's definitely in my, like, I will experiment more with this card. And then we have a rolling boulder. Um, units here, ha it's a four mana artifact. Uh, units here have tap, give rolling boulder a push. It rolls as far as possible and deals four damage to each other unit along its path. Um, <laughs> I read at Gen Con that someone was combining this with the turtles, which ignore the first damage they take each uh, turn, so that um, you know that player was able to use Rolling Boulder without substantial danger to their own creatures, but uh, for you know the opponent, obviously. Uh, the boulder crushes most creatures. Um, I think that, you know, this is a pretty powerful, like, recurring damage effect. And if you have, um, you know, a way to use it asymmetrically, it seems pretty sweet. Um, I think also if you're clever about your map construction, you can make places that are you know, safe for your um, avatar and not safe for your opponents. So, um, yeah, I think this is a kind of like fun build around me. How can I leverage this? And, you know, it's it's an exceptional card, so you can have multiple copies in your deck, so it's not too implausible that you'll find one, so you're not going to get super punished for building around it. I mean, you still have a 30-card deck and, you know, have to find uh, a 1 in 10, so... You know, it's not always going to show up early, and it's, it can't be the only thing going on in your deck, but uh, I think it's a cool card. Um, oh, interesting. Oh, yeah, that's exceptional. Okay, so the elite from this is Angel's Egg. Uh, at the end of each turn, the control of Angel's Egg's sight heals one life. Um, I think that life gain in this game feels surprisingly good. Uh, I feel like the kind of the longer a game you're trying to play, the more concern you have of um, just getting you know, beaten down before you execute your plan. Um, creatures are a like reasonable way to defend yourself, but there's a lot of interaction with them in terms of other creatures killing them. Um, but like life gain will kind of protect you to an extent from players targeting you with um, just like burn spells and burning you out. Um, I'm not sure if one a turn is enough life gain. Uh, I think it's probably not. Um, you know, it can just be hard to make a game go long enough. Also, if you draw this card off the top of your deck. Uh, later in the game, um, it's it's just not giving you much life at all. So um, I think I tend to shy away from this as a source of recurring life gain and prefer uh, like vampires or even you know birds with equipment or um, you know the earth spell that gives you seven. Uh, I think the water like stream of life is also totally fine. I mean, the water stream of life can be huge. It's one per water space, and given how much capacity uh, water has to flood the board, um, I guess it could be up to 20 life. Um, what else we got here? Um, oh, yeah. Um, Mad Dash, two mana, draw a card, then give an ally movement plus one this turn. I think that, um, you know, this is clearly weaker than Blink. Um, the strength of a lot of the air and water effects that move creatures is that it doesn't use their action. 
And so Mad Dash is substantially weaker because it, it uses their action. Uh, you know, that said, it's a cantrip that replaces itself. And if you're in fire, um, you know, this and blaze are the two main ways of making your creatures move faster, along with like seven league boots. Um, I think that a creature unexpectedly having extra range is um, can you know throw off people's planning. Uh, and I imagine since blink is such a common way of doing it, people see that you're not playing air. Um, they might you know plan a little less around mad dash as a possibility. So uh, I think it's like a role player predominantly in fire only uh, spell books. Um, or I feel like if you have a very cantrip oriented deck because you're trying to get very specific cards, and you know it's a totally fine inclusion. Uh, definitely built decks where um, they just had a huge pile of cantrips, and the goal was just to find a few of a specific card. And in these cases, you're like, it doesn't really matter, you know, what effect this has as long as I get to draw a card when I play it. Um, okay. Next pack. Um, all right, we got a mix air. So this is a part of a cycle of cards. Uh, there's one for each element where it costs one. It's an artifact, and you can sacrifice it any time later to um, have no. Requires no threshold costs and three less to cast. String bears next air spell. Okay, great. So for whatever um, element the mix is associated with, uh, there's no threshold requirement. Uh, so this is an incredibly potent tool for casting uh, spells. It's it's a lot like dark ritual from magic. Um, Though it's even better at color fixing and also requires no color basis. So, um, when I think of playing a very rampy Pathfinder, um, you know, if I have a lot of high end creatures, this is a way of like powering them out. Pathfinder's mana can also be weird because they don't have as much control over their Atlas deck. So, um, the, the element fixing can be interesting. But um, I don't think it's just restricted to Pathfinder. I think that any rampy deck where you have a bunch of high-end cards, um, the mixes are good. Um, additionally, you know, there's not that much card draw right now, but um, you know, once there are enough card draw effects, uh, it gets relatively less expensive to you know, use these kind of ritual cards to get something out fast. And, you know, just the ability to, on turn one, play a mix, and on turn two, uh, like, play a card that costs five. I uh, can make five cost cards kind of a, a sweet spot in a, an accelerating strategy. You know, the mixes are elite, so, um, you know, in theory, you could play up to eight of them. And once you're playing eight of them, you know, the chance that you have one in your opening hand can be like pretty high. So you could intentionally build a deck that um, uses mixes and um, ramps. And, you know, you, you can play them in a deck with the wrong elements, you know, as long as you're reliably getting threshold. You know, you can play an all air deck and eight mixes and just try and like always cast a vampire in turn two. Uh, you know, not saying that's a good idea, but, um, you know, there are uh, a lot of, like, pretty high-end cards that, you know, getting out early can give you advantages. Um, you know, like, what if you play an Amazon on turn two? Um, and, you know, like, what if your opponent, like, doesn't have a ton of spot removal? Like, they're playing more expensive, more efficient removal. Well... Yeah, now, now this Amazon gets to stomp everything for a while. Um, or like, what if you, you know, follow up with an environmental suit where, you know, the Amazon gets all kinds of, 
you know, burrowing and void lock, and now a lot of the removal spells don't work. Um, so, yeah, I think there's just, like, a lot of interesting lines of play. I think these cards are uh, super powerful. Um, I think that, you know, in Magic, this effect is generally strong enough that they stop printing cards like this, and they also stop printing cards that were like this but weaker. Um, yeah, I think that even though, like, Philosopher's Stone is the, you know, super chase rare, um, and, you know, for good reason, I think maybe Philosopher's Stone is most, like, Soul Ring, like, it effectively makes lots of colorless mana. Um, you know, I think these mixes are much closer in effect to Black Lotus. You know, they don't cost zero, but they do cost colorless, and, um, you know, you, you can't get the mana boost on the same turn, but if you set it up the turn before, I, I think they're just incredibly strong, so. Um, enough about that. Are there any other new cards in here? Or any other pretty cards in here? Yeah, got a shiny border militia. Um, yeah, this is, I think, gorgeous. Yeah, I love the, just like the reflectivity in the sky. Um, you know, it's kind of a gray day in Seattle, and um, I think it kind of takes on the kind of gray hue of the sky here, so that's kind of fun. I wonder if it was like a brighter blue day. If, would look brighter in blue. Um, anyway, it's nice. I think um, Boarding Militia is, a, is like I think pretty playable, um, especially if you build towards it. So, um, you know, I think any playable foil is likely to be more valuable and also like you know, maybe, maybe I'll foil out a deck sometime. Uh, all right. Fourth pack in this column. So the elite here is uh, Grandmaster Wizard. Um, which we'll throw down here. And um, I have mixed feelings about Grandmaster Wizard. It draws cards, and I love drawing cards. Um, you know, drawing three cards is fantastic, and I think in general, you know, two, two mana per card is, uh, you know, not a bad rate. Um, I think that, yeah, in Magic, maybe a sorcery might be like, spend five mana to draw like three cards, maybe four. So I think maybe it hasn't done that for a long time. Anyway, uh, the point being, like, by the time you get to six mana, uh, there's a real question of, like, would you rather be drawing cards or, you know, would you rather be playing a, like, six power creature that's going to be completely dominating the board? Um, and, like, depending on whether your cards are expensive or cheap, like, if you've not been putting a lot of presence on the board um like can you afford to spend six mana doing kind of nothing um so i'm not like against this card i think it's amazing and i think you know if you're playing something like death speaker where you know you can recast it or um you know it's like very good um but i think that in uh, deck construction it's tricky if you're um, you know, like if you have too much like card draw that doesn't do anything, um, you know, you, you can get yourself in trouble. Anyway, for a very similar cost, there's a Sphinx that has a, um, kind of like riddle mini game. Uh, you, you know, you get like a powerful body that's flying and, uh, you get a cool card draw effect. And, um, <clears throat> I think... I think I tended to play the Sphinx more often than the Grandmaster Wizard. Um, so, uh, food for thought. Uh, what else do we have here? Ooh, we got a, a Foil Minecart Madness. Um, yeah. A 
if I see that as you know playable for someone who's playing in Earth and looking for ways to move their their stuff around efficiently. Um, feel good about that one. All right, next pack. All right, I got an aqueduct. All right, so the uh, the elite here is Screaming Skull. Whenever a bearer attacks and kills an enemy, it untaps. Um, there are definitely some interesting combo-y things that are possible here. Like if you put it on Battle Mage, Battle Mage has like whenever they kill, attack and kill an enemy, a minion, uh, they draw a card. So if, uh, if an opponent has many creatures that are smaller than your uh, avatar, you can you know, basically trade life from your avatar getting hit to um, make many attacks and kill many creatures. Uh, I think this is also if you have a big and powerful creature and um, you know, want to like clear out a bunch of opposing creatures, uh, this this could do some work. Like um, there's a hydra in water that's immune to non-lethal damage, and I feel like if you throw this skull on it, um, you know the hydra can has six power and can like chow down on basically all the guys in a pile. Um, that said, like I'm not sure how often there are m multiple opposing creatures within reach, um, or just like how creature heavy, you know, different good strategies are. Um, and, um, you know, your, your creature taking incremental damage from each thing they attack is also a risk. But, you know, it like, it has sweet sequences where you're like, fight their creature, take some damage, and then like, you know, untap and attack the site they're on, or attack a creature, kill it, untap, and then be available for interception. Um, so I think that if you're kind of, um, into building, like, powerful Voltron creatures, uh, this is pretty good. Um, kind of the more equipment I want to throw on a creature, the more I want to play water, um, so that I can play Dodge Roll, which is, um, I think the only reactive spell in the current set. And you know, lets a cre lets you move a creature that's being targeted uh, out of its space, so that can protect it from you know the artifacts on it being disenchanted or um, you know just other unpleasantness. Okay, what else do we have? Anything else new or pretty? Ooh. Um, so this is a foil ice lance. Um, I think I think I like the way that grays and silvers take foiling in this game. So um, I think that's just really pretty. And um, yeah, so far the fact that the foils lay flat and look gorgeous um, makes me want to play with foil cards. Um, and I I never want to play foil cards in Magic. They're always like warped and. Um, I'm so always worried about them being, you know, tournament legal and, you know, losing value over time as they curled up. Um, but in this game, they just look ever so pretty. All right, uh, next pack. Oh, all right, yeah, this one's really great. Um, so this is Dream Quest. Uh, it's one mana. Uh, you choose a creature, it falls asleep, and uh, if it takes damage, it wakes back up. Uh, if at the beginning of your next turn it's still asleep, uh, it wakes up and you get to search your library for a card. So, um, you know, obviously it's uh, a lot like Demonic Tutor, and um, you know, getting to search your library for any card is uh, you know, incredibly great. 
uh, spending only one mana to do it. It's also quite powerful. Um, I really love the thematic design of this. Like, it feels like a dream quest, like the creature falls asleep, and it offers opportunities for counterplay for opponents. And I imagine in high-level play, uh, you know, when someone casts their dream quest, you know, being ready uh, either with, like, you know, stealthy guys to pop in and stab them or, um, you know, having some way to control light and bolt from far away or, you know, w whatever it is, uh, being able to stop the dream quest is probably, like, a critical point of counterplay. And, um, yeah, I, like, part of the reason I love this design is, you know, a powerful effect like Demonic Tutor um, can... Uh, be like format defining and uh, in, a, in a game without counter spells having no way to stop someone from searching for the perfect card um, can be I mean it's not like obviously frustrating but um, you know people don't know what they're missing um, when they can't they don't have counterplay options but I think this just provides like cool moments of interactivity um, so, you know, super powerful card, uh, really, you know, it goes into all of my air decks, and it's a strong reason to play air, and, um, yeah, happy to open one, and love, love the very flavorful design. Um, anything else new in here? Nope. So, on to the next pack. So, um, Shifting Sands, Genesis, reactivate the Genesis abilities of your nearby deserts, plural. Um, so, getting to reactivate a desert is, you know, great in terms of damage. Um, you know, if, uh, if the map is set up the right way, um, you know, you could trigger multiple nearby deserts. Um, and, you know, I, I think, you, like, in, in reality, like, you know, not a fantasy land, uh, there's definitely scenarios where you could reactivate three deserts at the same time and do some pretty massive damage. Um, you know, I think that, um, if you're playing fire, uh, you know, this, this feels like an auto-include, um, like, you know, predominantly fire. Um, I just think that, like, combining deserts um, is so strong, and, you know, the incremental damage to minions um, from deserts really helps burn spells kind of, like, finish the job. So, um, super, super into that site. Uh, and then Iceberg. I don't think I've ever seen this before. Um, it's an exceptional site. Minions occupying nearby sites can't submerge or surface. Uh, it's water. Uh, so that's kind of interesting. Um, you know, in general, not letting things submerge would be a drawback in water. But if you're playing like water not as a submerged deck um, and you don't have a lot of submerge units, uh, this is a way to protect your own um, things from being submerged. I can also imagine people, like, if there's a you know, strong water metagame, people playing this just as a splash, like, you know, as a, a colorless site, effectively, uh, to create a whole zone where things can't be submerged. And, um, or, you know, as a hoser where, you know, someone else has their thing submerged and then they, you know, lock down the space. So, um, I think that this is probably good in a variety of, you know, aggressive uh, mid-range or controlling strategies. Um, Alright, so we got a, a second copy of uh, Queen of Midland, so, yeah, Queen of Midland for trade. Um, let's see, did we get anything else new in this pack? 
everything else looks familiar, so let's put this uh, gray wolf on top. And then you know, I think these are probably going to get off camera soon if I play too long, so move these over to the side. Monastery Gargoyle, 5 mana for 3 power. At the start and end of your turn, choose whether Monastery Gargoyle has Airborne or is a non-minion artifact. Um, Try to think about... Oh, shoot. Okay, so I'm trying to think about when is it that um, being able to be an artifact is better than being a creature. And I think it's usually when you know that you're going to do something very destructive, like um, you know, if you're about to submerge all creatures and artifacts, um, you know, a creature will die, but the artifact will just be... You know, underwater, and maybe you have a way to get it back later, or um, you know, maybe you're about to uh, drop a major explosion, and you know the artifact doesn't care, but if it's a creature, it, it would perish. Um, so I think that's like an interesting ability. Uh, that said, five mana for three power. Um, you know, I think three power is vulnerable to a lot of kinds of uh, you know attacks. And um, that's not a great rate. So I think unless you're um, some kind of like very controlling deck that is using the area of effect things that could you know hit your own stuff, um, yeah, I have trouble seeing it. Um, yeah, I've, I've never put it in a deck. Um, yeah, uh, another Taurus Hammer Trinket. Um, okay, so our, our elite site is a bottomless pit. Whenever a non-airborne minion enters the site, kill it. Um, you know, I think this card is very controlling, and um, you know, I think there's a way to build you know site decks for control decks where creatures are just incredibly stymied. Um, a lot of them are more punishing to non-air creature, non-airborne creatures than otherwise. So, um, I like that these sites tend to make airborne creatures a little more, um, <coughs> incentivized. Um, I think there are also some kind of combo-y things where you can pull or push something towards this bottomless pit, like, you know, flood it so it's a water site, and then, like, riptide something into it, or, um, <clears throat> you could probably give, like, harpooners flying, uh, and then use the harpoon ability to, you know, drag things into the site, so, um, it, it offers some, like, interesting build-around-me facets, um, you know, that said, it's an elite site, so you'd want to have other payoffs for dragging things around. Um, otherwise, it's, like, just a little too cute. Um, and, of course, you know, if your opponent isn't playing many minions, then all of your cute combos don't, don't do anything. Um, yeah, I think they've made a good job of... There used to be some really powerful auras in the set that um, were like a better endgame than uh, minions. I think at this point, you know, it's probably like a very burn focused deck that doesn't really play minions, but it seems like most decks play minions. Okay, uh, anything else new or interesting in this pack? Uh, nope. 
all very familiar cards. So uh, that's nice. I, um, I'll probably make a spreadsheet and see how close to um, play sets there are of the ordinaries and extraordinaries. But um, you know, hopefully one box is uh, close to enough to have uh, a place out of the basics, and it's really just the elites and uniques that are hard to track down. So, um, Lava Salamander, I think we haven't seen this one yet. Uh, two mana, one power, Fire Spellcaster, takes no damage from Fire Spells. Um, you know, this is not a very exciting card to me. Um, I think that... You know, having only one power means that it's you know dies to everything uh, except fire spells, and um, like if it had fire spellcaster and immunity to fire as an upside, you know if it had two power, um, you know maybe I'd play it. But my fire decks really are often um, you know aggressive and trying to deal a lot of damage. And, you know, this can't even really, like, attack us, uh, an avatar and live, um, which I think is a big minus. Like, you know, if I'm casting a lot of fire spells to, like, keep the board clear of other minions and then never really get to act because there's so many sick, like, that's, that's where this creature would shine. But, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's so close to being, uh, I think not, like, a great card, but, like, a good card, um, but I think like as it is, there's just there's other spellcasters available that are much better, and I think you can just usually template the location of your fire spell that you don't need your uh, spellcaster to be fire immune. Um, so kind of a miss for me, um, and too bad because I love fire spells and I wish it were a hit. Um, all right, Marine Voyage. This turn, your units can move between any sites in a chosen body of water as if they were adjacent. Um, not quite as good as Minecart Madness because there's usually um, more land than water. Uh, but if you're in a water deck um, and you want to reposition everything, this is this is it. Um, and I've definitely seen people play it in games to good effect. Um, and I think, it, yeah. Obviously, better in limited than constructed, but um, <clears throat> I think that you know s sometimes you just have like huge creatures which you want to be in the right place, and um, Riptide you know doesn't move things far enough. So I, I think this is like very playable, especially if you're playing like a bunch of the um, you know like Kraken that um, like pop up and attack you know strike everything adjacent. Um, and uh, I think that there are like a variety of other submerged cards where being in the right place and untapped is important to them. Uh, but I think you tap to move. Yeah, they, you still tap to move, so this doesn't help with that in particular. But um, still, spending like fewer turns getting where you want to go can be critical. And um, you know, if you have a bunch of out of position creatures and you know flood an opponent's site. If they can all like move in to attack the site, you can also you know get an avatar pretty quick. So yeah, I think like mo like it's a game about maps. Mobility is good. This is an incredible mobility card. So if your you know deck is set up to exploit it, um, it can be amazing. Uh, what else? Uh, okay, standing stones. Um, this is one of my favorite sites. It's an elite site where ley lines converge. Minions here are spellcasters. Um, there aren't as many cards that, um, have limited steps that they can be cast from, or, you know, are projectiles that are shot along the line. Like, in general, um, I wish that where your spellcaster was mattered more. That said, uh, there are, you know, sufficient cards where position matters that um, this card which turns your creatures into spellcasters uh, can be fantastic. Uh, there's also um, the unique ritual where you know for each spellcaster presence you get you know two mana and obviously if all of your creatures are spellcasters uh, you know exceptionally good things can happen. 
Um, also things like Pact with the Devil, where you know you sacrifice the caster. Well, you know, good good news. The cheapest foot soldier can you know go into the Standing Stones and make a Pact with the Devil, and good job, you sacrificed a one power creature and drew three cards. Um, so yeah, I, I just think um, you know it depends on the deck, but uh, often being able to turn things into spellcasters is great. Uh, I think it's like fire that in my experience cares the most about spellcaster position. So I you know often think about uh, playing this in my fire decks. All right, what else do we got? Uh, the rest of these look like they're um, known quantities, so move on. Okay, um, okay, so recurring specter. This is a uh, two mana for one power. Uh, it can't defend, but it can be cast from your cemetery. So, um, you know, when I talk about things that are good at being sacrificed, um, this is a great one. Um, it doesn't, it costs you mana, which is, you know, less than ideal. We like it better when it's free. But, um, you know, uh, if your, your witches need to sacrifice, the spirit's a, a good choice, you know, good, good for deals with the devil when it's on standing stones. Um... You know, if you have uh, the right pieces of equipment, you, know, you can tra trade these up. And um, I think there are just a lot of applications. The fact that it's um, a spirit also means that, um, I think combined with evil presence, you can give it charge. Um, so if you have like a lot of mana and you know, don't have a lot of cards, you can kind of always assemble something you know, a little threatening, um, or like, you know, that's like a hassle for your opponent to deal with. Uh, and yeah, just like in general, cards that can come back over and over again tend to be powerful. And I, I don't expect this to be any different. Um, you know, I expect more things that sacrifice cards over time. Um, and uh, one of my favorite cards that we haven't talked about or seen yet, it's, uh, it's Pen Pen Octopic. Manuscript or something Cthulhu like that, which is uh, you know, uh, the you, you tap a creature with it and draw a spell, and then the creature takes damage equal to the cost of the spell. So um, you know, e either things like turtles, which ignore the the first damage they take, or like you know, a, a recurring creature that you know, if it dies, you can just bring it back. Are um, you know, legit ways of continuing to fuel the manuscript. So yeah, thank. You. I, I, like this card sets the imagination wild, both with you know current set cards and uh, imagining more sacrifice synergies in the future. Uh, no other new cards, but uh, lots of burn spells in here, which is exciting since I I love direct damage. Um, yeah, I think that they've done a, a decent job of toning down uh, the damage. And the template sizes of area of effect spells, but they're still solid and I think birdie things are uh, still quite good at sorcery. All right, Sea Raider, uh, three mana, three power. Whenever Sea Raider attacks and kills an enemy, its controller discards their topmost spell. You may cast that spell once this turn, ignoring threshold. So uh, this is a very fine source of card advantage. Um, you know, it's, it's a three power creature, so it's a little fragile. Um, and if your opponent isn't playing any minions, um, you know, it's, it's just a three power creature. But, um, you know, I think that if you have like a, you know, one of the amulets to throw on it so that it becomes four power, um, you know, like this, this creature can be made bigger than most creatures, and, um, you know, I think the sequence, which is, you summon this, you've used your mana to do it, the next turn it untaps, and, you know, you get to attack, and, you know, have four mana at the ready, um, you know, like, 
you can cast a lot of your opponent's spells on that. And, uh, you know, maybe your opponent's spells don't, like, fit in with your strategy, so it's not, like, you know, straight-up card draw, but um, it's not bad. And um, I certainly think about how to, you know, include cards like this in my deck. Like, I want every deck to have ways to draw cards or, you know, ways to recur cards. You know, basically I want things to do with my curve early so I don't get run over. And also I want, you know, how am I going to win a nutrition based game? And, you know, this is a, a good attrition card. Um, Chain Lightning, two mana, two air threshold, deal two damage to target unit nearby any number of times. You may spend two to additionally target a new unit nearby the previous one. Um, I think, I haven't checked the FAQ, I think this could jump up back and forth between two creatures. But, um, yeah, it's like a very solid burn spell. Um, you know, uh, it's a little awkward for killing things with three power. Uh, because you need to hit them twice, so you have to have like six mana to do that, and like another thing to bounce the lightning off. But you know, I think particularly when combined with, uh, you know, fire magic, you know, having like a, a desert to bring the damage up to three um, can be great. And also, you know, just uh, if you have a lot of mana. You know, in the later game, this can provide a you know sink to get useful damage out of it. So yeah, I think it's um, it's not the most efficient damage card anymore, um, but it's still like it still gets work done. And I think if you're playing a burn heavy deck, uh, it makes it in. Or if you're playing an air deck and um, you're looking for versatile things that. Um, you know, can be like controlling early or like close out the game later. Um, and obviously it's like totally fine for finishing off a death store avatar. Uh, so, you know, generally speaking, like this card. Um, the elite here is uh, Astral Alcazar, which we've already seen. So I'll uh, see if anything else new is in this pack. And it looks like we're, we're probably at the point where we've seen almost all the Ordinaries and Extraordinaries. Alright, next pack. Uh, Scavenging Fiend, 4 mana, 2 power, Genesis, Contra, Broken Artifact to this location. Uh, I haven't 100% checked the rules. I'm pretty sure uh, Broken is like dead, so I think um, this is like, you can get an artifact out of your graveyard. Um, not sure if you can get out of an opponent's graveyard, so you know, have some rules questions. Um, I think that a lot of artifacts get buried, like I think um, Cave-In and Earthquake and um, whatever their water equivalents are. Um, you know, put a lot of things underground or underwater. Uh, so this isn't going to help with those. But I also imagine that with, um, you know, the, the mixes being something that someone, like, plays and then they, like, keep on the board and probably don't spend till the next turn. And the cores and the Philosopher's Stones being, like, powerful. And... Um, you know, there being some other high-value equipment, um, I could certainly see a metagame where uh, disenchants um, or dispels or unweaves, you know, th things that destroy all the artifacts in the space become popular, um, if, if for nothing else than mana destruction. So um, I think the ability to recover something uh, seems interesting. Uh, also, if you're playing a lot of mixes yourself um, and sacrificing them, this offers you the opportunity to uh, recur them. And uh, obviously, if you're playing with something like Death Speaker, uh, you know, Scavenging Fiend could recover you know more than one of them. And uh, so I think this uh, 
you know, I wouldn't be playing this card for its two power. I'm, I'd be playing it for its its conjure effect and or its genesis effect. And um, I think in the in the right place, this could be extremely good. And also, if you can um, grab your opponent's things. Um, you know, it, it creates even more value to playing disenchants and destroying their artifacts. So uh, I think that's super interesting. Uh, shrink, set the base power of target nearby unit to zero until your next turn. Um, I think that, you know, obviously this needs to be combined with some damage to finish something off. But as far as um, like relatively universal ways of killing anything off. Um, this was actually really good. Um, you know, with things like Drown or Bury, like maybe they have Burrow or Submerge. Um, and uh, I guess like polymorphing something into a frog is a little more expensive and also like pretty universally effective. Um, but this is a little cheaper than polymorph, so it's like a little more efficient. Anyway, I think it's a, a very interesting option uh, as a you know removal type effect. Uh, Phantom Steed, uh, movement plus two, void walk, and you carry an allied minion. Um, I'm not sure how useful dragging another thing through the void is, but um, you know I do think that uh, plus two movement can you know get something somewhere real fast. Um, you know, I think this is another, like, how do my men of lane get where they're going, or, um, you know, how do, how do I get my sneak thief in position fast, or, um, you know, th this can only carry one thing, so it's, it's not, you know, how do I move my giant pile of earth minions uh, to places where they can drain my opponent. Um, but moving plus two, like, this can also be just, like, how do I get where my opponent's avatar is to finish them off at death's door. Um, so I think that the, you know, two power is kind of like too low and I, like, this isn't really what I want. Um, but, um, I think if you're looking for a lot of moving creatures around, uh, it can be powerful. Like, like the amoeba that, um, you know, it doesn't leave spaces, and every space it moves to uh, just increases its power. Like, you know, I, I think if you're trying to, like, build some kind of amoeba-focused fo deck, which uh, I think it's elite, so I don't think there's any tutor that finds it, so I think you have to be playing, like, Dream Quest and Browse and, you know, like, have some pretty serious card draw going on to find the amoeba, but... Um, you know, the amoeba combines well with seven league boots, but if you're like, how, how else can I make this amoeba spread quickly? You know, I think this is the kind of thing that gets interesting. Um, all right, my, my next elite is Mirage, and um, maybe like, I don't know, maybe like replaying Crossroads or something is sweet, but I mean, just in general, feels real bad to like replace a site with another site. Um, you know, like it feels like you're falling behind on land placement. So, um, yeah, unless there's just like really good comes into play, Genesis effects on, on sites, um, I have real trouble imagining wanting to play Mirage. Um, I'm not sure if we've talked about Vile Imp. Maybe we have. But, um, you know, I think this is just, like, very efficient. It, you know, it burns things. It leaves a body of a good size behind. Like, I think it's just kind of like the bread and butter of fire decks. Um, anything else? Oh, I think we've seen the rest of these, so... Let's put the sweet cantrip here, and... I think we'll move to... All right, this is uh, pack number 39. Final packs from uh, this booster box. All right, uh, so Stormy Sea, submerge all minions and artifacts occupying target water site. 
Um, you know, I think that this is you know, just a super solid controlly water card. Um, I think it's also like you can play it in a mid-range water deck where you're, you know, play, playing creatures, probably, you know, submerge ones and um, just supporting your creatures by, you know, flooding areas and uh, drowning out opposing things. Um, you know, it gets, uh, gets awkward when you have a mirror match and your opponent also is uh, playing water things, but this is one of the strengths of water where, you know, a, a bunch of their sites are rivers and let you scry, so you have a, a much better chance of, you know, just being able to shift away a card that isn't the right card for you and, um, you know, find the things that are good for the match. Uh, buried Treasure, I think we've already talked about, um, you know, love the flavor of the design, um, need, need things that are better at, um, you know, digging stuff up efficiently to, like, play it in Constructed, but definitely want to play it in Limited just because it's, um, such a, like, fun thematic thing. Frost Nova, I think we've talked about this. Okay, so, um, Maddening Bells is the elite here. Uh, four mana, uh, spells cast by a nearby spellcaster cost two more to cast. So, um, we haven't seen a ton of, like, prison-style cards in Sorcery yet, but, um, you know, I think there is a strategy where you attack your opponent's mana base. Um, you know, I think the deed that gives you control of their things, Conquer, Worm, um, Craterize. Also, um, sometimes opponents are trying to cast you know, ramp up and cast, like, two small spells a turn, and uh, Maddening Bells gets in the way of that. So, um, yeah, I think that this is uh, probably at its best in some kind of ramping deck, and, um, you know, I think that having cards like, uh, you know, Riptide that allow you to push, you know, your opponent's spellcasters, like, back into the area affected by it, right? This isn't symmetrical, like, if your avatar or spellcasters are outside of the Maddening Bells, and they just have one that's inside the Maddening Bells, like, it hurts them, but doesn't hurt you. Um, and I think that uh, this definitely hurts opponents who are trying to play more expensive cards because it you know adds cost to cost. Um, so I think this is a pretty strong card, and um, I think it's just kind of a question of like how many players are playing um, you know more expensive cards. Uh, but it can also like you know if someone is playing like a super aggressive like. Fire and Lightning deck, um, you know, even they are probably playing, like, Incinerate, and they just want to play, like, four sites and then focus on drawing spells and, and getting you, um, and I feel like if you're forcing them to spend time, you know, either moving out of the bells or, you know, drawing and playing more sites, um, I think you can, like, you know, effectively, like, freeze some cards in their hand for a period of time and, like, buy yourself more time to, you know, do whatever your game plan is. Uh, so I think this is, like, super interesting and uh, definitely will experiment with it in decks. Um, also, I think, you know, in my Men of Lang fantasy, uh, I think some people might say it's bad form to make people discard random cards that they can't cast, but um, I think... You know, having things like bells trap the cards in their hand, it's always temporary and, you know, gives your men of laying maybe, like, time to get rid of their cards before they solve the bell problem. Anyway, um, yeah, so, cool card. Um, we'll definitely experiment with it. And, uh, yeah, I think that's it for new cards in this, uh, this pack and... This column of boosters in this box. So, 
Uh, that's my first uh, box of sorcery. Uh, I had a really fun time opening it. And uh, you know, glad I decided to record it. It's been nice that um, some people have you know, gotten vicarious enjoyment either from uh, you know, the excitement of opening packs or just hearing my, my thoughts on the cards. So um, I'll probably open another one at some point. Um, Especially if I don't have a full set of um, like ordinaries and extraordinaries, um, yeah, I'll probably open another one. It's a good time, and uh, yeah, thanks for watching. You know, subscribe if you're interested in more stuff. I think uh, at this point I've committed to making some uh, some deck text, so. Uh, not sure exactly when that will happen, but uh, sooner rather than later, I, uh, now that I have these cards open, I'm feeling really excited about playing, and there's a local group up here that plays. Okay, take it easy.